Um, so thanks everyone for joining me bright and early. Um, I'm hoping to make, you know, this is like a, an action packed presentation with a lot of content. I'm hoping that someone, you know, everyone will be able to take something away. Uh, excuse me while I open my LaCroix real quick. Um, so I'm here to talk about the organizational impact of design systems. And um, I should tell you upfront that um, I am a principal designer at Salesforce. I am on the sales cloud team. I'm not on the design system team. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about that relationship. Uh, momentarily. As is traditional for Salesforce, I have to start with this, this nice little legalese slide. And what this is saying is I'm going to talk to you in this presentation about how we work at Salesforce and I'm going to talk about some things that we are going to start doing differently at Salesforce. We are a publicly traded company. Please do not make any buying decisions based on anything I share with you today. Make any buying decisions based on what we have in the market today. So I want to start here. And um, this is a slide from, uh, we have this thank you slide uh, that we shoot every year. This is the San Francisco based UX team in our ugly holiday sweaters. Uh, I think they're pretty sweet actually. I don't know that I would call them ugly. And uh, we did this photo shoot. You can see my face is in the U there. And uh, you know we have a great team, about 150 people. And this is just the people in the San Francisco office who happened to be there that day. Uh, we have a, a pretty global team. And we always start with thank yous because we can't do anything that we do without the whole group. Um, a lot of these people participated in sharing their experiences with our design system, um, sharing what works for them and what doesn't. And I'm able to do this presentation because they were forthcoming and helpful. Um, so big thank you to the entire uh, design team here at Salesforce. And then I wanna call out six people in particular who really contributed. Uh, Ali, Alan, Steph, um, all part of the a core part of the design system team, just huge insights, pointed me to tons of great resources, and they've been running a lot of different studies, uh, looking into how things are going today. And then Guy, Sanka, and Jason really supported uh, this presentation, provided rounds of feedback, and um, were just instrumental, all of these people, in putting this presentation together. And I'm thanking my contributors not just because they're really freaking awesome, but also because I'm not an engineer and I'm not a part of the design system team. I'm on sales cloud, but I do have a background in service design. And what that means is I'm accustomed to going into complex systems and looking at how products, services, systems, people, processes all come together to form a whole that is experienced by users and customers. So what I'm gonna provide you today is a holistic outside in view of our design system, how it's impacting a lot of different levels of our organization. And it's complemented by this inside out view that I was able to get from these wonderful people who gave me that inside out perspective. If you're looking for more of an engineering perspective, uh, we have some great talks out there. Gina, Isha, Steph Ruiz have all given excellent talks as well as some other people. So, Let's dive right in. Um, today I'm gonna share how our lightning design system at Salesforce impacts our design process, our engineering process, our business goals, and the growth of our entire ecosystem. And I'll explain what I mean by that. What I'm hoping that you'll take away from this is maybe some practices to incorporate into your work, some morning inspiration, uh, how you can evangelize design systems, not just to those usual suspects, but really across the entire organization. What are the keywords people are looking for? Um, what is really gonna resonate with people across the organization? And also an understanding of our challenges and the kinds of problems that success can cause you, just so you're prepared. So some critical background information, some things you just really need to know. First is uh, the Lightning Design System has been around for about two and a half years. These are all the versions that we've released so far. And um, you know we're working on one today. And in that time, uh, it has grown tremendously. I can't um, share numbers with you without getting PR approval, but um, our growth has been steady and consistent over time. And um, we have a lot of monthly active users from the entire world, from hundreds of countries all around the world. So this is really tremendous. 
And um, when I talk about growth, there's two things I want you to keep in mind. This is one of them. And the other is this. So a couple months ago, a group did this study looking into the impact of the Salesforce economy. And uh, what they found is by 2022, we're gonna be driving 3.3 million new jobs and more than $859 billion in new business revenue globally. And uh, the reason I'm sharing this with you is A, to give some context to what growth and scale mean at Salesforce, and B, I need to tell you a little bit about what Salesforce does so that you can understand our design system. And um, some of you might know this, I can tell you before I started here, I had no idea what Salesforce did. You know, some of, some of the things that we do, we have a suite of product offerings and those product offerings, those products and services enable people to do their jobs. So we have solutions for salespeople, helping them do their jobs, solutions for service providers, uh, customer service reps, solutions for them to do their jobs, solutions for marketing people. We're really this giant platform, this giant suite of solutions upon which people are doing their jobs. So when we're making something internally, the impact of that is not just our immediate users or our immediate customers. It's really a pretty huge sort of economy or ecosystem of people. So what I'm saying here in a simpler diagram is this. Around our design system, which is really the core, we have an entire ecosystem of partners. They don't work for Salesforce. They're not part of our organization, but they are part of our ecosystem. And those partners are working with their clients. They're working with all the other companies who use our products and services. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about what those partners do in a second. But we really have this entire ecosystem built around our design system. And that's an important thing to note about the impact our design system can have. We also have, I mentioned, this suite of products that are built around our design system. And at this level, in this kind of concentric diagram circle, uh, concentric circle diagram I've put together, um, the product level has design, PM, and engineers as part of that, uh, part of that level. And then in between the product level and the ecosystem level, we have our business. This is Salesforce as a company, the leadership across our entire organization. And the business level is doing two things. They're built around our products and they're also built to enable our ecosystem. So that business layer is both looking inward at that product layer and looking outward at the ecosystem layer. So I'm gonna tell you all about how our design system impacts each of these three levels, the product level, the business level, and the ecosystem level. And I'm gonna do it through quotes and anecdotes from real design system users. So this is all those thank yous I said to people sharing their experiences, uh, sharing research studies, doing research studies, all of those things really fed this presentation where I can bring you real anecdotes from real people. So we're gonna walk through Alvin, his experience as a developer at that ecosystem layer. He's one of our partners. We're gonna look at Jasmine, who's a general manager of the Salesforce product inside Salesforce. And then Vanita, who's a user experience designer at Salesforce. We're gonna go through from the outside in. I did say this was an outside in holistic perspective. So let's start with that ecosystem level. Now, this is a real quote from people like Alvin. I don't know if you've heard this before, but the shit is complicated. Lightning design system made onboarding a hell of a lot easier. Now, Alvin's not a real person, but he is a sort of amalgam of a lot of real developers who work for one of our ecosystem partners. And I want you to understand what Alvin does uh, because it's, it's interesting and it's an important part of our business. It's Alvin's job to develop mockups, prototypes, and customizations to out of the box things that we offer, as well as building things from scratch for his clients. And his clients are all of those people out there who are our customers and our users who have these different instances of Salesforce. They have a different subset of our product offerings and someone like Alvin comes in and he helps them with those. He makes, he's part of our ecosystem and he does customizations 
for their business processes for their unique needs. So I want to walk through Alvin's working process. Uh, generally, he's doing two different kinds of work, potentially. Um, he's doing proof of concept work and he's doing implementation work. So when Alvin's doing proof of concept work, this is kind of what it looks like. He's using a browser tool to mix and match HTML to do these quick mockups that he can show. Or he's, and potentially, or he's designing in a sandbox that has client access so that he can collect this constant client feedback. So it's really important for him to be able to throw these things together really quickly and then just iterate on them and get client feedback on them. And he's checking the design system for visual guidelines and code back and forth as he's doing this work. He's checking the design system for code and guidelines and he's using the design system GitHub to actually do his designing and prototyping. When he's doing implementation work, the work itself is slightly different. He's either building custom components or he's customizing out of the box, sort of off the shelf features in his clients, in his client Salesforce instances. And again, he's checking the design system. He's looking at the components that he could use. He's reviewing them, he's comparing them, and he's using the design system to get code. So what does Alvin say about the design system? What do people like Alvin really think about this, this, this experience that they have, this working process that they've built? Well, people like Alvin tell us, I can prototype without having to worry about styling. It all matches lightning experience. And I want to unpack that because it's so powerful. Alvin is out there. He's putting together these quick mock-ups, these proof of concepts, and he doesn't have to worry about his clients not trusting the quality of his work because it doesn't look good. He doesn't have to worry about styling. He puts it together and it matches the lighting experience. So we're enabling Alvin with the design system to earn the trust of his clients. And then the next two are just such a key value prop for Alvin. Development is quicker with fewer roadblocks. Delivering key customizations is so much faster. I mean, these really speak for themselves because he's able to do this going back and forth, checking the design system, getting code, using the design system GitHub. Everything is just faster for him. And this middle one, this, the, the bottom one, delivering key customizations is so much faster. That's really a key value prop for Alvin because he's doing customizations both in proof of concept work and an implementation work. So he's trying to build these customizations and it's hard work and this makes it faster for him. Then these last two things are really big sort of impacts value providers for Alvin uh, that are unique to the Lightning design system for him. He says the components are targeted to enterprise apps. He doesn't have to go and find something off the shelf and go, hmm, this is really great, but you know, it's like not quite right. It's not gonna handle as much complexity as I need it to handle. So I'm gonna have to customize that. No, he gets things like right from the design system that are already targeted to the kinds of enterprise problems he's helping his clients solve. And then lastly, people like Alvin tell us, I know I'm following usability best practices. This is really, really powerful. The last thing Alvin wants is to build something for a client and have them come back and go, hey, so you know that thing you built suddenly no one is using it anymore i know you made this change and now it's hard to use and no one likes it we don't know what to do he knows that usability best practices are baked in and that gives him a lot of confidence and it gives him more of an ability to meet his clients needs and do great work for his clients and therefore for his clients users so if we were to summarize the impact that the design system is having on people like Alvin, on our ecosystem partners, are easier onboarding into a complex product ecosystem because he's right, the shit is complicated. Access to baked in usability best practices. Uh, Alvin just knows that usability is already considered in everything he's using. Faster development, faster customizations. And this ability to create without worrying about styling. He knows that it's going to look good, it's going to look right, and it's going to fit inside the solutions that his clients already have. So, summarizing this all, our design system at this ecosystem level is reducing friction and enabling our partners to do this fast, consistent, user-friendly work. 
And I can't stress enough how important this is for our business. That, those numbers I showed you, the 3.3 million new jobs by 2022, that won't happen unless we can reduce friction and enable our partners. Our partners are just a critical part of our ecosystem. And if our partners can't do consistent work, work that is consistent with the offerings that we have, and they can't do work that's user-friendly, then we're shooting ourselves in the foot. So the design system, by reducing friction, enabling our partners, is helping our users and it's helping our business. So if your design system is open in any way, if people outside of your company are using your design system, tell this story. Just seeing this from the rooftops, it is such a powerful thing to be able to do with a design system. It's such a powerful piece of the impact story. So let's zoom in one level and let's look at the business level of impact. It's that in-between level, in-between the product and the ecosystem. And I want you to meet Jasmine. She's a general manager, so she owns and manages one of our product clouds within Salesforce. And again, Jasmine's not a real person, but she is based on real people inside Salesforce. Jasmine tells us, I need everyone to be focused on customer success. Are we doing right by the customer? Are we maintaining trust with everything we do? Jasmine's job is driving revenue and she needs to deliver a competitive product to market. What does that mean, delivering a competitive product to market? It means she needs to listen to customer feedback. She needs to listen to what customers need. She needs to look at what else is out there and she needs to make some really tough trade-off decisions. So let's dig into that a little bit, what that looks like. This is a typical week for Jasmine. I don't know about you, but every time I see this picture, I like grimace a little bit, like back to back, side to side, like that is a lot of meetings. But this is really what Jasmine's week looks like. She's talking to customers and those customers can be super angry, they can be effusive, they can be demanding, but all of them want to express to Jasmine, hey, here's what's going on, here's what we need next. She's also reviewing progress on revenue goals. So are we meeting our targets? Are we on track? She's checking in on product milestones and key projects. Again, are we hitting our targets? Are we on track? Are we hitting the milestones that are gonna meet our customer needs? Because I just heard some new ones today and I'm not sure we're in the right place. I'm not sure we're going the right direction. So she has to prioritize constantly and she has to communicate those trade-off decisions to her design engineering and PM leadership. That prioritization part is such a critical part of what Jasmine does day to day. So if we're to boil down Jasmine's goals, she's trying to build the right solution for the customer. She's trying to hit her revenue targets and she's trying to maintain efficient and effective teams. Now these goals are not mutually exclusive. There's a lot of overlap between these. They're really just part of one you know, mega goal. But let's dig into how the design system helps Jasmine meet her goals because just looking at this, it might not seem quite obvious how the design system fits in, but guess what? It does in a pretty major way. So building the right solution for the customer. You've already gotten a little hint of this from Alvin's story, but what we hear from, from people is uh, a designer told us the design system has allowed us to quickly move past tactical conversations like what buttons look like to focus on the strategy of our user and business goals. And an engineer told us, I am no longer tasked with creating the design of pieces. Instead, I'm tasked with creating a solution. From the bottom up, like just from this bottoms up perspective, we're meeting this top down goal of building the right solution for the customer because the design system enables everyone to focus less on those pieces and focus more on the solutions focus more on how the pieces all come together. So hitting revenue targets, how does that relate to the design system? Well, we heard from a PM, the standards help elevate discussions away from why things like buttons or forms look a certain way to focus on our larger customer need for the feature. Now here I shared an engineer and a designer saying similar things, but this PM perspective where this PM told us, you know, we're elevating to this focus on larger customer need. That means that 
all three of our kind of key stakeholders at the product level from the bottom up are meeting business needs through having this design system to elevate the discussion, to focus on the solutions. And focusing on that larger customer need, as you heard from Jasmine's typical week, is a big part of how she hits her revenue targets. And then finally, maintaining efficient and effective teams. We've heard from a design leader, design is faster, alignment is easier. The time saved across teams validated the value of a design system to our execs and stakeholders. The time saved across teams. This is not a story that is you know, often told that I hear. You know, we're, we're efficient, we're more efficient, we're saving time, but we are. The time saved across teams, this alignment, this faster design is really a big sell for execs and stakeholders. And it's something that makes Jasmine very happy. So a lot of overlap here, but I wanna summarize the kind of takeaways from this. And we're hearing this from our designers, our engineers, our product managers, and our leadership from the bottom up to Jasmine's level. The impact of the design system is that more teams are more focused on creating those right solutions and there's productivity gains across the functional groups because they have the shared language and they have the pieces to shape into solutions. So if I were to put this in business stakeholder language, I'd say, you know what? Our design system increases productivity and it enables us to focus on the customer need. So if you are talking to business stakeholders, these are huge selling points. Definitely tell these stories. I do wanna pause and say, clarify one thing here, which is that at Salesforce, our customer and our user are generally not the same person. Our customers are the people who buy our products and services. Our users are the end users who are doing their jobs using our offerings. So Jasmine is really focused on the customer need. What is the customer asking for? And at the next level, the product level, you'll see that Vanita is really focused on the user needs. But this is a virtuous cycle. If we're giving our customers what they need for their business to, to be successful, we're enabling our users. And if we're giving our users what they need to enable them to do their jobs, we're making our customers successful. So it's a really virtuous cycle there. And if you're evangelizing to business stakeholders, stop and consider whether your customer and your user might be different people and try to just get in the heads of people like Jasmine, what they're trying to achieve and connect with them around the goals they're trying to achieve, which may be increased productivity and more of a focus on customer need. Because ultimately this does help our users and our business. So let's dig into this product level. And I don't know everyone who's on this call. And in fact, if people are chatting, apologies, I can't see both this and the chat at the same time. Um, but I'm a designer and I'm assuming many of you are as well. So let's look at Vanita. She's, again, not a real person, but based on real people at Salesforce. She's a designer, and she says, our design system gave me a shared vocabulary with other designers, PMs, and developers. It lets us focus on the experience, not just the pixels. And we've heard this a little bit from people like Alvin and, and at Jasmine's level as well, but this is really interesting, right? It focus on the experience and a shared vocabulary. It's Vanita's job to design and deliver great user experiences in collaboration with her PM and two engineering teams. So let's take a look at Vanita's working process. And some of this is gonna look familiar, but some of it is quite unique to Salesforce. So over the course of a release cycle, Vanita starts out as most of us do. She identifies and researches the problem. And she starts to put together some iterative concepts. Uh, what could I put together that might solve the problem I've identified? And, uh, you know, then there's a little bit more to it, right? Through a lot of iterative loops, she checks the design system. She checks Lightning design system. She reviews and compares components. Um, she evaluates whether what she's selected makes the most sense for what she's trying to solve. She gets user feedback. So she puts her concepts in front of users and says, hey, is this delivering the kind of value you expected? Is this helping you do your job? And then she's having check-ins. She's having check-ins with the UX team, her sort of core team. And she's also having those collaborative sessions where she has the shared language with her engineers and her PMs to say, 
are we building the right solution? And then there's one other part where the design system comes in, and that's what we're starting to call UX office hours. And this is where our accessibility team, our platform team, and our design system team come together and they review those concepts and they provide feedback based on their area of expertise, the accessibility um, perspective, the platform perspective, or the design system perspective. And this is a really powerful way for Vanita to get additional feedback. And as she moves towards the end of the release, make sure that everything is aligned, that all of her concepts are solving problems, building solutions, creating experiences uh, in the best way based on all of our organizational knowledge. So what, is, what does Vanita say about the, about the design system? What, is, what does she feel like the impact of it is? Well, we have a sketch UI kit. It really speeds things up for her. So she can go back and forth this step right here, checking the lightning design system. She can review the guidelines multiple times a day. And she also has this UI kit to just really speed things up for her. That step where she's iterating with her PM and engineers, she refers to the design system. She can point to a best practice. She can say, you know what, this is how we solve this problem here. Uh, it's been vetted, it's been validated. We've been doing it this way for lots of good reasons. And uh, you know, there's no argument. Everyone has this shared language and they can focus on the experience. And then this last point, she says, the moment I didn't have to redline my designs and I specced with token values, wow, that saved me an entire day's worth of work. I mean, I don't know about you, but I don't love redlining. I don't want to spend a bunch of time doing it. And specking with token values is a huge time saver. And all of these things lead to better user experiences. Even that token values thing, your engineers don't have to, you don't have to sit with them and make sure that they got every detail right. A lot of that is baked in to the tokens, or baked into the components already. So it's saving everyone work. But hmm, you may have gotten an inkling of this already. It's like not all roses, right? People like Vanita also tell us the design system both speeds up and slows down the design process. There can be anywhere from one to three rounds of all of those iterative steps that I shared. Team design critiques, design system and accessibility office hours, and reaching out to other designers who are doing similar work to share and review. So better user experiences, yes, but potentially at a cost. And we're gonna talk about them when we talk about our challenges. So I wanna pause, I'm talking about the design perspective, the business perspective, I'm talking about our ecosystem partners, but one of the things that our design system has a huge impact on is our internal engineers. And so these are quotes from, from inside Salesforce where our engineers tell us, the design system allows me to work with styling without working with styling. This allows for rapid prototyping without having the prototype look like a skeleton. I mean, we heard this from Alvin too. He can throw something together and he doesn't have to worry about the styling. It just, it looks good, it looks right. And our lightning components have a global CSS architecture. Uh, our engineers don't have to go in and component by component declare the CSS. There's just centralized styling. And then this next part, one of our design, one of our engineering leaders told us, development is about three times faster since the design system allows grab and go. That's incredible. Uh, the lightning components, they're maintained by the design system team. Uh, they have accessibility and HTML5 compliant markup all baked in. And this is giving engineers a way to just go in, grab what they need and use it. Huge time saver. And we did hear about this with Alvin, about kind of how he's working and all the time it's saving him. But it turns out that has huge impacts inside Salesforce as well. So to summarize, faster development, almost no redlining, this better cross-functional communication and collaboration where people who might otherwise have some trouble communicating in the same language can communicate in the same language and work together, and this focus on experience instead of on interface. So the Lightning Design System has increased our speed of prototyping and development, and it's allowed better collaboration that's focused on great user experiences. And I'm probably preaching to the choir here. You probably all already know this, but this summary, this kind of like, what are the key, what's the value prop of this at this level? If we're talking to PMs, engineers, and designers who might have really different perspectives 
what should we be focusing on when we sing the praises of a design system? We advocate for a design system, we educate about a design system. Well, at this level, increased speed and this collaboration that is able to focus on experience, huge sellers. And ultimately, our design system inside Salesforce has radically changed the way our designers and our engineers work. In one of the studies that we did, we reached out to people who were here before the design system and people who were here during the transition to the design system and people who were here after. And what we heard is, you know, that transition can be a little bit rocky, but our lives changed a lot and now we have a shared language and now we can work faster. So, talked about these levels of impact, impact at the product level, the business level, the ecosystem level, but this is just physics. Impact creates pressure. And there's a lot of pressure in the system that we have right now. And I wanna talk you through what those pressures look like because it's important. So we met these three people, Alvin at our ecosystem level, Jasmine at the business level, and Vanita at that product level. And I highlighted a lot of overlaps that they have, a lot of things that are really providing value for all of them, but they do have very different needs and they benefit differently from the design system. Alvin is really looking to meet his client's needs. Jasmine is looking to meet customer needs and Vanita is looking to meet user needs. And those needs are not always in alignment. So let's dig into each level. At the ecosystem level, Alvin, people like Alvin, they tell us, we love what you have. Uh, one quote that I didn't include here is from an ecosystem partner who said, beautiful in all caps was the first thought that I had when I saw the design system. Our ecosystem partners love it, but they want more and they want it yesterday. So that outer layer of just kind of needs and demands puts pressure on our entire organization to create these more and different tools for our partners who are really focused on meeting slightly different kinds of needs. So it's putting pressure on all of Salesforce, on all of our business layer. And then if we look at the business layer, we have Jasmine saying, yep, yeah, we absolutely have to grow the partner ecosystem and we have to continue to grow all of our product offerings. So no big deal, let's just grow everything at once, Easy, we got this. Well, it puts pressure on the product level and it puts pressure on that relationship between the product level and the design system itself. And suddenly we start to get into a lot of trade-offs. I'm gonna tell you what those trade-offs are in a second. And then at the product level itself, Vanita, the PMs and engineers that she's working with, we heard from them that they no longer have to focus on pieces they're focusing on solutions. They're focusing on these tougher user and customer problems. And those problems require more bespoke solutions. What does that mean? New lightning components. So there's pressure from the outside in, all on this core of the lightning design system. And there's pressure sort of reverberating throughout this entire system. Now, I think we've all had this experience of, um, this kind of file name. It's like really the final one. This is it, it's the last one, this is gonna work. We incorporated everyone's feedback, it's done. Like 18 versions later, you realize that it's not done uh, and it never will be done. Surprise, uh, design systems are not a one and done activity. Even when everything is going super well, everyone is happy, everyone loves it, it's not done because it takes ongoing education and effort to deal with those pressures to continue to grow, to even to just maintain, takes ongoing education and effort. So I'll tell you that inside Salesforce, we are learning how to adapt to our own successes and the expectations that come with it. So our current focus areas, our key challenges, our current areas of growth, this is where we're really uh, focused right now. Documentation and support, our contribution model, and I've said this word a lot, prioritization and trade-offs. And you've gotten a little hint of these things so far, but I'm gonna really call them out now. Our key challenge with documentation and support is this. How on earth 
Do we provide guidance at scale? When we start growing, when we continue growing to that 3.3 million new jobs, how do we provide guidance at scale? So internally, on the left here, uh, designers are telling us, I lean heavily on members of the design system team to suggest new relevant patterns. Well, I can tell you that even from my own perspective, uh, I lean heavily on members of the design system team too. I'm reaching out to them on Slack going, hey, uh, Alan or Ali or Steph, uh, where's this thing that I'm looking for? Our resources are pretty scattered uh, internally and externally. And we can't have uh, a small group of people responsible for shepherding everyone towards the information that they need. And then from the outside, our ecosystem partners are telling us, okay, so I want a holistic view of how the components fit together into larger molecules. And I want implementation notes on when to use what. So you can see that there's slightly different types of needs here. Inside the company, designers are saying, hey, where's that resource? Um, hey, can you give me some expert recommendations? And outside the company, people are saying, I just want this like documentation to cover not just the atomic components, but also the molecules and the organisms. I want some best practice guidelines. I wanna know what typical patterns are at these bigger levels. So everyone's asking for more guidance and slightly different kinds of guidance, which is difficult. Next is contribution. The key challenge here is really, we need to maintain quality without bottlenecks. How do we evaluate and make sure that things are right and good and enterprise level and solving the right kinds of problems and you know, tightly consolidated, not sort of a distributed mass of lots of things solving the same problem in different ways, but how do we do that without making bottlenecks? Uh, on the left here is a quote from a PM who says, unfortunately, I feel that the design system team often wants to offer a square peg for a round hole rather than approve a new idea. Well, the design system team owns and builds everything, which limits the throughput of new patterns, but they're ensuring quality. So when they're offering the square peg, they're like, look, this is such a good square peg. You're going to love this square peg. It's just, it's vetted. It's excellent. Um, it really solves a lot of problems. And uh, when you have a round hole, you're trying to, trying to figure that out, that can be a little bit frustrating. So there's bottlenecks there. And then on the right here, uh, sometimes a pattern doesn't exist and the process of implementing it can be long and confusing. Well, our current contribution model has, uh, is, is really open and um, our designers, our engineers, our PMs are all kind of bombarding the design system team hundreds of people at a time going, I have this new pattern over here. I have this new pattern need over here. Hey, what do you think I should use over here? I think this thing might not be quite right. Let's talk about it. Uh, it's a lot of inputs and the process becomes complicated because of the next thing, which is prioritization. How do we as an organization and how does the design system team both grow and maintain this quality, maintain uh, the internal and external resources at the same time. And what we hear is, well, the design system team has to prioritize executive asks, then things for release, and only then the design system website. So they're having to make these trade-offs between documentation and support, between uh, contribution and sort of taking in new patterns, uh, and they're getting pressures internally and externally. And there's just no simple way to balance those internal and external needs. And the processes are there, but really the time is the limiting factor. The design system team is responsible for a lot right now, and they're trying to both grow and maintain at the same time. So like, yikes, right? This is a lot of really tough problems for us. So I wanna share with you a couple things that we're trying out right now. Really our next steps are things that we've, we've pretty much already, we already have in flight and that we're working on. We're trying to make prioritization easier and distribute contribution. So contribution is very distributed right now. Uh, and prioritization, there's a process for it. We're just trying to reduce the friction of those things and distribute contribution in a slightly different way. So here's what we're experimenting with. The first is monthly consistency themes. This is things like typography or process builders or certain types of flows. Uh, and they're themes that are really helping us prioritize our growth areas. So everyone can kind of dogpile on something specific and say, okay, we're gonna get this nailed down. We're gonna work on this and it'll help us prioritize everything else. 
uh, and it really helps on bottleneck because suddenly you can pull a lot of things together and sort of tackle them in one go. Our UX office hours, you saw this in Vanita's diagram. Well, I showed it in the diagram coming sort of at the end, sort of toward the end of the release cycle, but we're really trying to make those office hours available to designers pretty early on in the release cycle. And the reason for that is that rather than having every designer and their engineers and PMs sort of uh, coming at the design system team with lots of different similar patterns, office hours can point designers to each other and say, hey, you know what? You and someone else are actually solving some pretty similar problems. You should connect, you should consolidate, you should evaluate, get inspired by each other, collaborate. And then the pattern that gets submitted, the kind of new contributions are a little more robust and um, the quality you know, has the potential to be much higher because it's solving multiple problems. And it really takes a burden off of the design system team to have to do all of that consolidation. And then the last thing is a regular cadence of work in progress reviews. This seems like an obvious one, like of course, everyone's already doing this. Different teams are doing it differently. And we're really adding more intentionally this idea of vetting new pattern needs. So it's not just happening at office hours, but it's happening at a regular cadence throughout the course of our work. Where we're evaluating new pattern needs. We're uh, consolidating with other people from across our teams, from across our broader UX team. So I want to summarize, uh, wrap up, and then move into Q&A. So we talked about the impact and pressures across levels. That ecosystem level that's so important to us, the business level, they're all important to us, the business level and the product level. And we talked about all of those pressures that build up going inside and outside and the challenges that are coming with the impact that we've had. And then some things that we're trying, our approach to scaling and growing to that 3.3 million new jobs by 2022. So takeaways here are that our design system impacts people across the entire organization, not just the usual suspects, not just the people you work with directly and beyond. And that impact is different for the different organizational roles. And it's really important for us to be savvy about those differences, both so that we can solve the right problems and so we can speak coherently, strategically to those different people about what it is that the design system can do for them, what it is that it is doing for them, or even what it is that it's not doing. We can have better conversations if we understand the kinds of differences in impact. And then of course, success is always gonna create new challenges. You reach impact, well, impact creates pressure and there's always gonna be more impact and more pressure. So if you only take away one thing from this talk, I want it to be this. Impact starts at the core and design systems really require ongoing effort. So thank you again for being here and uh, looking forward to your questions. Awesome, thank you for that. Um, let's see here, we do have a lot of questions and we'll try to answer them, as many of them as possible. Um, so first question is, how do you measure the time saved across teams? How do you track the number of hours? What kind of metrics do you use to gauge that? Um, that's a great question. Um, I would say that in general, uh, we are, I've talked a lot about being cross-functional and collaborative and uh, we, we are more and more cross-functional and collaborative because of the design system. But previous to this, I would say that each team, the functional team, has really used different types of criteria to evaluate um, their efficiency, their speed. Uh, and I, can't, I can neither share what those are or really speak to what metrics are being tracked um, because they've all been different. So it's a great question and I'm hoping that maybe with the next presentation we do on our design system, we can include more on uh, you know, targeted metrics that we're starting to track. Awesome, thank you. Okay, let's see, next question is, how would you suggest designers at agencies build design systems in that they are designing many products for many different clients? Um, so I've worked at agencies and uh, none of them had design systems. Uh, that's a tough one. You know, I really think a big part of um, uh, the, okay, so a big part of how our design system works internally is that it's ours. It's focused on solving our unique problems. 
at an agency, the kind of primary need is different. At an agency, you're trying to make sure that um, you have a sort of higher starting point. You're not starting from scratch every time. Um, so just remember that it's a very different kind of goal that you're working toward and your base components are going to be pretty stripped down and they're going to be pretty uh, generic in a lot of ways. Uh, and you might really be more focused on kind of a sketch UI kit than any sort of robust documentation or um, anything like that because you're going to have potentially a smaller team and more in-house knowledge. I don't know if that's helpful, but that's about what I can offer. Awesome, thank you. Um, next question is, can you talk a little bit more about the Lightning design system? Um, what does the future look like for that? The future for the Lightning design system? Um, you know what, I'm not on the design system team. Um, this was more of like an outside in impact story. So unfortunately, I genuinely can't answer that. And what's the format of your team's UX um, office hours? Um, yeah. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, our office hours are awesome. Uh, so our UX office hours is um, a room full of uh, sort of representatives from each group. That, so the accessibility platform, we have ops there, our UX ops team, and we have our um, uh, design system team there. And designers sign up for a time and they come in and they show their work in progress. It doesn't have to be this, you know, polished thing. It's not a presentation. It's, hey, here's what I'm working on. Here's the problem. Uh, here's my proposed solution. And here's any supporting information or constraints that are important for you to know. And then it's sort of rounds of feedback and discussion. It's super collaborative, very much like, you know, I saw this thing the other day and I thought if you haven't seen that, it would be cool for you to see. Or, uh, you know, um, actually someone else is solving this problem the same way. Thank you. Okay, so this next one is a little lengthy. Lengthy. Um, how did the team grow organically to match the needs of expanding the design system? Um, obviously, you can't start with 100 designers or 100 engineers. Um, how did you get it built up from a, a smaller starting point? I can give you a somewhat generic answer to this. Apologies, again, I'm not on the design system team, um, but I can give you the outside in perspective, which is uh, our design system team uh, started slightly bigger than it is now, uh, and it's actually smaller now, more of a kind of maintaining group. And it started with a sort of pilot group, so they started working on it. A few people started using it, then more and more people started using it, and its usage scaled out. Um, it didn't just kind of start with like, go, now we have a design system, or hey, every single person who's a designer or engineer just start contributing to this. It really was a sort of bounded core team and those bounds grew. Okay, thank you for that. Um, we do have time for a couple more. Um, yeah. Okay, so you mentioned that having a design system means that designers don't argue about certain problems that are solved. Um, how do you prevent stagnation of, of the system and arguments of authority where nothing is questioned? Love this question. Um, okay, so uh, we really view our design system as this kind of living, breathing thing. So, uh, and we're all encouraged design, engineering, PM to question and to really build the right solution. So our culture is very much around building the right solution, not around maintaining the solutions we already have, not around, um, we already figured everything out, let's just like reproduce our success. So that's a big part of it. You know, there's never a, uh, any, I would say, hesitation to question. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Let's see here. What tools do you use for building a design system that works with um, cross-location? Um, I'm not sure what you mean by cross-location. We do a lot of sort of localization since we work globally. Um, and we um, have a lot of um, kind of accessibility teams working on this, different kinds of teams working to make sure that uh, our design system is accessible globally across many countries. Um, but, you know, mostly it's kind of the website and the guidelines that we offer there. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, is 
is the whole design system team involved in maintaining lightning or is there a specific team working in a in adding and uploading new modules components etc the design system team is the team that maintains lightning design system so lightning as a sort of its own entity that we all use to build out our products. I mean, we all work with the design system to further lightning as a broader concept, but the lightning design system is a core team. Okay, thank you for that. And thank you for the awesome um, slides. Um, and if we have another webinar. Um, we have an, another webinar coming up at 1030 and we'd love for you to stick around. And thank you again, Shahrazad. Thank you all so much. And I'm so sorry I couldn't answer all of your questions, but it's been a pleasure being here. And um, these are great questions. So, uh, you know, best of luck and enjoy the rest of the webinar. Thank you.